Good afternoon, and welcome to the session. I hope a lot of you got a chance to see the keynote in the morning where we announced this product. And I'm really excited you could be here as we take a deeper dive into what we've built. Some housekeeping details before we get started. There's a session feedback link, uh, hashtags, and a video recording of this session will be on YouTube uh, in 24 hours. In the next 45 minutes, we've got a great agenda. I want to start with talking about why you should even care about in-app payments. Then we'll talk about what offer offering is, both in terms of the user experience and the API. And we'll talk about how you can start implementing this in your apps as you leave this room. But let's start with introductions. Now, throughout the blogosphere, there are always a lot of speculation about what happens to startups once they've been acquired by a large company. Most of the team that built this product started their journey in a very similar way. We came from an acquisition that Google did in August 2010, a small startup called Jamboo, with a product, Social Goal, that helped developers monetize from within their applications. And we're really happy to be here in a short span of time having built this product at a Google scale. My name is Amit Fillet. I'm a product manager on the team. And I'll be joined by Mikhail and Luke, uh, engineers who helped build this product. The web has evolved. And so has the way all of us make money on it. In its infancy, Web was all about selling physical goods and accepting payments. Developers built front ends to their existing stores, took payments, and shipped the goods. Then we saw a transition where not only were they selling, they were actually advertising these goods on the web. Search ads, display ads, this was all possible because of the introduction of really sophisticated ad platforms that could target and reach users in a very precise manner. We saw a lot of publishers build engaging websites, attract eyeballs, and hence make money through ads. Now, over the last few years, we've seen another interesting model come about. Selling virtual goods from within an app. This has been led by the social and the casual gaming space. Some estimates put this to be a $15 billion market by 2012. So we've seen a lot of different waves come ashore, starting with what I call as the shopping wave, all about e-commerce, B2B, B2C models, then supplemented with an ad wave that was all about building audiences and making money through advertising. And in the third wave, is what I refer to as the microtransaction wave. We've seen increasingly users embrace a model where they are willing to shell out 99 cents, 79 cents for a song, for a tractor in a farm, for ringtones, for apps, for rentals. And that's a model that really is something new. Let's look at another interesting trend on the web. We all live on an increasingly social and connected web. At the end of 2010, there were 10 billion accounts that were created on social networking sites, online worlds, and MMOs. And astonishingly, half of those accounts were still active. There's a reason a lot of us here are willing to pay four bucks for a cup of latte. It's not because of the coffee. It's the experience of walking up to the store, listening to that music, seeing the barista brew a fresh cup of coffee. That's what we are paying for. It's the same reason a couple of years ago, huge number of users lined up in lines for hours to watch the latest movie, Avatar. It was the 3D glasses, the IMAX cinematic experience. That's what stood out. They were willing to pay a premium, in that case, with their time, in order to get that experience. 
And we are beginning to see a similar transition happen in the online space. It's no longer a web where you go and click on some links. Users want to be absorbed, engaged in the web apps. They decorate their profiles, create playlists, upload pictures, create mashups, share with their friends, build their farms for hours, build chocolates and games. It's the experience that's driving them there. It's no longer only about utility. So when we look at a confluence of these trends, a microtransactions model that's being embraced by both sellers as well as buyers, an increasingly connected and social web, and a user who's inclined to pay a higher price for experiences. When you combine that, that's a huge opportunity for all you developers. And in order to help you capitalize on that opportunity, we introduced the Google and app payments for the web. Now let's look at what this platform has and what this ecosystem would look like. But before I do that, here's some more specifics about what we're announcing. All US developers will be able to leave this room and sign up. There is a flash version of the API that we will be releasing in a few weeks from now. And our plan is to go live this summer. Now, the, there's a reason we are staging this launch, starting with the developers first. First, we want to give you some time to help integrate and prep your apps. And we want your feedback in order to iron out any things that's missing in this payments platform. So our hope is we can work together, build some really cool, engaging apps that we can get in the hands of consumers. What does this new web app ecosystem look like? At the top is the application layer. That's where all you developers come in. You build engaging, innovative apps, whether it's in productivity, publishing, gaming, entertainment. And you can find a distribution channel for these apps through a web store, like the Chrome Web Store, or through even your own websites. All of these can be powered by the in-app payments platform. What have we built? At the very core is the huge Google Payments infrastructure. This includes things like fraud and risk management that we don't necessarily want you people to worry about. That's something we have a devoted team looking at each and every day. We have state-of-the-art compliance, whether it's in the US or internationally, that meets all the regulations in the way we store our credit cards, the way we do audit, where we log data, and analytics that can help you get insights into how your users are converting. Where do they drop off? What time of the day are the most purchases in your apps? Things like that, which will be critical as you fine tune your monetization engine. Now, couple this payments platform with a large active user base. Any user who's bought an app on Android Market bought an ebook on our Google ebook store, paid for extra storage on Picasa, bought extra minutes on Google Voice. All of these users have created accounts. And you are bringing all of this huge payments infrastructure and a large user base into your app with a simple API. Literally, it's one call to initiate payments and one call to collect it. And Mikhail will jump into what that API looks like later in the session so that you know how to integrate. But that's really what we think is the beauty of this platform. One API that, in a way, hides away all of this payments complexity from you and delivers to you a large transacting user base from Google. And what your users who are buying these apps or playing within these apps see is a very frictionless UX. Again, we'll see a demo of that today. The whole goal is simple. Payments should get out of the way as soon as possible. Minimal steps, enter your credentials, pay, and get back to the app. And the best part about the user base is, if they've already paid, they don't have to enter credentials again. It becomes single click. Now, a lot of you have tweeted about this. You know, a lot of web apps charge 30% for payments, which we find a little ridiculous. 
it's almost become a default, and we are not ever happy with what the default is. So in the morning, you saw in the keynote, we unveil a flat pricing structure of 5%. Now, I want to emphasize there's no fine print here. This is not a pharmaceutical ad. This 5% means you can price your items at 25 cents, and because there's no fixed fee, you're never paying an exorbitant amount from what you get. You can price your items no matter what price points you like or your users like. The second thing I want to emphasize is this price point is not only applicable on Chrome Web Store, but on the entire web. So if you build an app and you launch it on your own website, you can integrate with Google in app and the pricing will still be the same. So that's what we're offering. A flat 5% pricing structure, a simple API, and a simple UX. Now to jump into the user experience, I want to invite on stage Jake from PopCap, one of our early adopters uh, who have a game, Plants vs. Zombies, some of you might know, that integrated with this platform. You saw Angry Birds in the morning, time for Plants vs. Zombie now. Hey, Jake. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So I'll give you a demo of the in-app purchasing, but since it's frictionless, it's a pretty quick demo. So uh, I'll give you a little rundown of PopCap first. Our mission is to make fun games for everyone, everywhere. Uh, our first game, uh, Bejeweled, is a good example of that. We released it uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, we've released that game on over 15 different platforms now. And for each platform that we release it on, we customize it for that platform so that the users, that's the first time they've ever played that game, they feel like uh, that game was built for that platform. Uh, we have six franchises, major franchises. Plants vs. Zombies is the most recent one. And um, that's actually what we're going to do the uh, demo with, is uh, we've got a trial version up on the Chrome Web Store. And so what we've done is we've added some additional content onto it. Uh, if you've never played Plants vs. Zombies before, there's two sides, plants, zombies. Um, there's about uh, 40 plants and about 25 zombies. Uh, and we've got some additional zombies that the player can add through microtransaction payments. Now, jumping into the numbers, if you look across all of our products, we've got about 60, uh, more than 60, uh, monthly active users that are playing our games. If we look just at Bejeweled, we've got over 2 billion games played each month. And if we look at just microtransactions, we've got over 3 million transactions a month at an average cost of 75 cents. Now, we've seen this business grow quite a bit. Just in the last eight months, it's grown more than 100% to more than $2.5 million a month, and now accounts for about 10% um, of our uh, uh, revenue. One other number for you. 75% of our purchases are reorders. And that's something that we're very proud of, because that's telling us that the users are trying our game and they're enjoying it and they're coming back. And that's where we want to focus, is we want to focus on making uh, those great experiences that players really enjoy. Plants vs. Zombies, uh, as an example, we spent three years making that game. And we spent a lot of time picking the right combination of plants and zombies and uh, trying to create a, a balanced experience. And so as we add new zombies to that game, we want to make sure that uh, that supports the old gameplay as well as uh, enhances and uh, evolves the game into a new direction. So we've got three new zombies for this demo. We've got a uh, zombie in Long John's. We've got a hairy-chested spandex zombie. And a naked zombie. All right, so let's switch over to the Demo. All right, so this is the trial version that's available up on the Chrome Web Store, and uh, we did a mock-up with it. And we added a uh, button so that uh, uh, we can purchase in it. We just called it the, the Google Mart. And in there, we've got our three choices, um, you know, spandex, underwear, naked. I think we should go uh, full money, go, uh, go fully naked. 
So the user experience um, is what you'd want. It's frictionless. It's just two clicks to go through the pur purchase sequence. We got the uh, API about a week ago uh, and mocked this up. Uh, it was really easy to use, quick to implement. Maybe I didn't uh, get it there. Oh, there we go. See what happens. Um, it was quick to implement, easy to use, um, which is exactly what you would want. Complete that purchase. And here we go. We will end up with our naked zombie that we can then play in the game. And uh, so, fantastic uh, experience. <laughs> so I'll hand it over to Mikhail to uh, talk through the, the details. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Flip back over here. I see. Aha. Great. So I'll tell you guys about the API that we've built. And as Amit has alluded to earlier, uh, we wanted to solve two major problems. Uh, first one is the buyer experience. We wanted to be very smooth so that people don't have any trouble making one purchase after another and they don't feel like it's an obstacle for them as they're playing a game or using your web app. And the second, of course, is that we wanted to make the API very easy for you to use so it's not an obstacle for you to build this in so you can integrate quickly and get paid sooner. It turns out that these problems are related. And so when you... Uh, when you build a simple API, you want it to model that buyer experience. So really, to make sense of our API, you just need to understand how the purchase works. And you've already seen that. So just to review the structure, let's say you have a web application where you can buy a star. There's a buy button. Buyer clicks on that buy button. It brings up the payment screen you saw earlier. Um, the buyer just has to either confirm the purchase or enter the billing details if they haven't already. Um, payment gets processed. They close the window, and they're back in the application, and they have the item immediately that they just purchased. So to implement this API in your application, you just need to worry about two calls. Uh, the first call will open the payment screen, and the second call will accept the notification once the payment is complete. So that same diagram in terms of the API, the, the click corresponds to the API call. When a buyer clicks on a buy button, the API call is made. And then the notification corresponds to uh, the end of the purchase. So the notification is actually sent to you um, when the purchase is complete, but before the buyer has closed that window. So once the buyer has closed that window, it's guaranteed that the purchase and notification has already been sent to you. We think that makes it a lot simpler for you to uh, handle that end of the purchase flow and gives you fewer corner cases to worry about. Let's talk about, uh, actually, before I go on, I should say one more thing. I've been using the example of a buy button, but that's really not necessarily the only way to implement this API. The API call is just a JavaScript library call, so you can trigger it on anything. For example, if you have another game and the user completes all the levels, you can immediately bring up the payment screen so they can buy more levels without them having to click anything. Before you start writing code to integrate this API, you'll need to do a bit to set up. You'll need to create a seller account if you don't have one already. Uh, and then you'll need to grab a seller ID and a secret key, and you'll use those to call our API to tell us who you are. You'll also configure a postback URL. That's the URL where we'll send those notifications once the payment is complete. Let's talk about that first call to open the payment screen. Uh, as a web application, you have a client side and a server side. This call starts on the server side where you use your secret key to uh, sign the parameters of the purchase that are being generated. Uh, so you'll define the purchase, you'll sign them with your secret key, that will produce a token, which is an encoded string. Uh, you'll embed it in your web application source code, and that'll get passed into our JavaScript library. Here's the actual code. Uh, this is Ruby, but it would look pretty similar in most languages. So you define the purchase. It's very simple to define. You just tell us what's being purchased, uh, how much it costs, 
and then you tell us who you are when you're calling the API. So that's that first code snippet. The line at the bottom is where you use your secret key to sign it and generate the token. Uh, that JWT.encode call is a standard library. All you need to know is you don't need to worry about implementing the signature algorithm yourself. And Luke will tell you more about that library we chose. Now you've generated that token on the server side, and uh, this is the client side. First, you'll include our JavaScript library. That's the first code snippet. Really, you just copy and paste that, and you're done. The second code snippet actually triggers the call here. We've set up a buy button with an on-click handler that calls a JavaScript function in our library and passes that item token that was generated on the server side into the library call. So after you've done that, the payment processing all happens on our side. The payment screen opens. We interact with the buyer to get confirmation or billing details. And once the payment is done, we've processed it on our servers, we send you a server-to-server -server notification. Um, it goes to that URL you've configured earlier. The details of that notification will include many of the same things you uh, put into the original JavaScript library call, including the item description of what's being purchased, the price, and when that purchase happened. We'll also include an order ID for you. Uh, you'll be able to use that later to reference this purchase. And importantly, you will need to echo that order ID back to us. That way we know that you received our notification, you were able to decode our token, and, and got the order ID out of it. So we know that the user can reasonably expect to have the item at that point because you've found out about the purchase. And at that point, we're done. Uh, the purchase has been delivered to you. This is the code to implement that notification handler. Uh, again, this is a Rails controller action. This function gets called when your server gets a post from us. It pulls the first line. You see it pulls the JWT parameter, the token, out of the post parameters. It decodes it using that same standard library I mentioned earlier. Um, you call some application-specific logic to give the item to the user. And then you acknowledge the, uh, the receipt of that post back to us by, by returning a status of 200 and the order ID in the body of the response. If anything goes wrong, you can just give us a different status code as a response, like a 400, and then we'll uh, understand that you couldn't deliver the item to the user, and so we'll cancel the order. That way the user doesn't pay for something they couldn't receive. Now, uh, you might have noticed that the server-to-server -server notification comes to your servers, but the user is probably using the client. So how will that item be actually delivered to the user? Of course, there's several ways to go about it. The simplest way to do it is polling, so your client could poll the server side and wait for the notification to come through. But we can do better than that, and so we provide an optional mechanism for you to use, so you can pass an optional callback into that JavaScript library call when you start the purchase. These callback functions get invoked when the purchase either succeeds or fails, and at that point, you know your server has also been notified, so when the callback is called on the client, you can check with your own server to see if you got the notification, instead of having to pull it all the time. Um, of course, you do still have to check with the server. The JavaScript callback itself is not enough. Um, the reason is any buyer with Firebug installed or a similar tool can go and invoke that callback on themselves and give themselves free stuff, naked zombies to their heart's content. Um, and so that's why you want to check with the server to make sure that the purchase actually did take place. So let's review the the whole picture. Your servers will define the purchase, generate a token to represent it, and pass it into the client. Um, when a buyer clicks on that buy button, the token will get passed into our JavaScript library. It will open the payment screen. The payment screen will talk to our servers, uh, complete the purchase, and you'll get a notification first on the server, and then when the buyer closes the payment screen on the client side as well. And now Luke will tell you more about how this will work in Flash. My name's Luke, and uh, I've been working with these guys since uh, back at the Jambool days. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the Flash integration, and as well as a few other sort of technical details as we got into it. So jumping right in here, this, is, uh, this API is actually going to be coming soon. So we're not shipping this today, but in, in the coming, you know, we'll, we'll get this as soon as we can. We'll get this out to you. If you want to integrate this API with a Flash application or a Flash game, you've, the first thing you need to do is get our library, our SWIC library. You'll download that from our uh, merchant area, and you'll get that into your Swift file, compiled into your Swift file. You can do that using the line command compiler, as you see here. 
But you could also use whatever other tools you use to build your Swift application. So if you're using Flash Authoring, for example, or Flash Builder, or Flex Builder, or FDT, whatever tool you're using to build your Flash application, you just embed our library in there as a Swift file, and you can then make references to the code that's in compiled inside of it. Now, the second thing you'll need to do is get access to a, a signed item token. And again, you'll need to do that on your server because you don't want to compile your secret key into your uh, running Swift file that's then in people's, uh, in people's browsers and stuff like that. So similar to the JavaScript side. Now, here we're showing an example of how to do that using flash bars or object embed using the Swift object library. Now, this, is this bottom snippet here is presumably on an HTML page that your server is rendering in the same way that they rendered the HTML page that hosted the JavaScript client. Now, in this case, we're just sending the same item token there, and we're pushing it into using a, a Swift object .add param. Now, this, uh, this implementation can work with exactly the same backend that's driving your HTML or JavaScript client. So you could, it's conceivable that you could have uh, a Flash game or Flash application that's running in one environment, an HTML JavaScript application that's the same application or very similar running for another environment that may not work for Flash. Uh, but your service layer could actually be identical. Now, some people aren't going to be having just one single button or one single item to purchase, and, and Flash bars may not be appropriate. And in that case, you can actually write an API, like, for example, maybe a catalog API. Uh, some, you're basically loading a collection of items off of your server. And all you have to do is include a signed token for each item that the user may purchase in the client. Uh, so that would work as well. Now, the, the next step is we're going to get down into into the running Swift file. So into your application, we're writing ActionScript 3 code. Now, this code is regular, plain old ActionScript 3. This is not, uh, you don't have to have a flex application. If you do, that's fine. Uh, there's no frameworks or additional code that you need to bring in. There's, but if you have other frameworks, it works fine alongside those. Uh, so in this case, we're going to take the uh, a buy button that you presumably have in your app. And like Mikhail said, for the JavaScript side, it could be some interaction that took place. Maybe you have a vampire that walked up to another vampire, and when they you know, collide, the buy screen shows up for some reason. Uh, in this case, we've got a buy button. And in our handler, we're going to attach to the mouse, mouse event, some of you may see there. We're in our handler, we're going to basically go out to the flash vars that we saw, saw on the previous screen and grab that item token as a string. So it's just an opaque string from the perspective of the running flash app. We're going to instantiate our library that came in in that SWIC file and call by item, sending it that, that token. Now, this is going to load and display the payment experience directly within your Flash app. So you'll be ready to go. The user will be able to finish their, you know, make their purchase. And then when they're done, you'll get an event. You can subscribe to an optional event like Mikhail described. Uh, but you'll definitely get a post back on your server. So you can basically handle that post back and award the item to the user. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about JSON web tokens. So to be clear, this is, a, this is a scheme that's in place for signing. And the purpose of these tokens is for us to verify that you were the person, you, the seller, were the person who created this particular item and associated this particular price and wanted to award it to this particular user. So what we're doing here is we're verifying that the price you've given us and, and who we're going to pay when, that, when we collect that user's money. So we, we don't want to let users in the middle, like open up Firebug and manipulate the amount they're going to pay for something. And we certainly don't want to let them manipulate who we're going to pay when they give us that money. Uh, so the important thing here is that we have your secret key is what you use on your server, and you use it to sign that information. So you create that packet of information, and you sign it with your secret key. And then you take that encoded string as, a, as, a, as an opaque package, and you pass it through to our, our APIs and your client. Now, the JSON Web Tokens is a very recent uh, innovation in, in sort of signing technology these days. Uh, there are a variety of libraries available to use that, that work just great. Uh, in, in getting this to work, we actually came through a few other implementations, uh, one of them being OAuth1 style signing schemes. Now, some of you might be familiar with OAuth1. Uh, essentially, this is an HTTP uh, coupled signing scheme, where you take HTTP parameters and you sort them according to some rules alphabetically. Uh, then you put some delimiters in there, and you assemble them. And it's pretty complicated. And the problem is it ties your signing scheme literally to your web server or web application layer. Uh, with JSON Web Tokens, you can actually sign these with native libraries in whatever language it's written in. You don't have to 
know what, uh, what object, for example, in a Rails app, we have a params object where our parameters live. And G so OAuth 1 was very complicated. We got into issues with, at, at Social Gold where we had a lot of people having trouble with, you know, what, did I get these in the right order? What do I do with optional parameters? What do I do with uh, other parameters that aren't even related to this signing scheme? You know, I've got some method parameter I want to send to do an HTTP delete or what have you. Now, all that stuff goes away with JSON Web Tokens. So we were really excited when we found this. And, and basically with this scheme, you just send a packet to this method in a library and you get back the token. And uh, on the other side of that, you can send the token into this library and get back the packet that was originally sent. It's really simple, it's really easy, and there's libraries in just about any language. So uh, we're working with the library developers. If you do find a library in some other language that's not quite up to speed, just let us know on our developer forums and we're, we're working on getting all those libraries up to speed and keeping them up to date with the latest versions of the JSON Web Token spec. Uh, so, with this spec, uh, we also have built a little bit of support into our merchant center here, where you can take the parameters, as you're trying to integrate, you can take the parameters that you've got, and you can put them into this web form, and hit go, and then see a token get built in place. You can actually paste that code in and make, it, make a call to make sure, you know, where's the problem as you're trying to debug? This will take, is my signing code the problem, or is my application code the problem? Is the library the problem? Like, what's happening? This will let you narrow that, that problem set down and see my signing code is actually generating a different signature with these inputs. There must be a problem in my signing code, perhaps in the library, perhaps in how I'm using it. Uh, and this is a great tool that uh, I think will be really helpful for a lot of people. Now, some of you may have noticed that as we, as we look at those diagrams that Mikhail had, we had this process beginning in a client, in a browser of some kind somewhere, and then our servers are calling your servers. Now, there's a little bit of an issue there in that you're probably wondering, how do I know which user was in that browser in order to associate this, uh, this purchase and give them the right thing? Well, the way we're, we're encouraging you to do that is through this field called seller data, which is just a field on the hash that you send to the library, uh, to the signing library. Put this in your JSON web token. It's an opaque string from our perspective. We don't care what's in there. You can put whatever you want in there, and you can use it to associate a purchase with a user in your context. So we're not going to leak user data to you, and we'd prefer it if you didn't leak user data to us. Uh, and it's important that you enco encrypt that data. Now, as I said before, JSON Web Tokens is a signing scheme. It's not an encryption scheme. So we're, we're relying on HTTPS for encryption, but we want to make sure that you, you keep your user information secure according to the terms of your relationship with your users, and that means secure from us as well. So you should encrypt that information. If you put personally identifying information there, you should encrypt it as you send it in, and you should decrypt it when you get it out. And we're going to just, we're going to pass it through. So we're going to send you back a JSON web token that's very similar, but not the same as the one that you sent us. And when we send that back, we'll include whatever you gave us in that seller data field. And that will allow you to do things like, hey, I just got a post back that said someone bought something. Here's who bought it, user ID 12345. But you can also do interesting things in addition to that, like, oh, this actually, this session was initiated from this referrer, one of my partners, and I want to award them some percentage of that fee since I made so much money only giving Google 5%, right? So now then, basically, you can have these sales, you can have discounts, you can have referrers, you can, you can put whatever you want in there. You can structure that information however you want as long as it encodes and decodes to JSON. So if you want to put some other binary blob in there and just encode it as a string, that's fine. Now, I'm going to wrap up with that and bring Ahmed up here to finish this thing up. Thank you. Thanks, Luke uh, and Mikhail and Jake. Hopefully that gives you a sense of what the experience is, what the API set looks like. Um, just to quickly re recap, simplicity has been our core focus. Um, in all aspects of the product that we've built, API, user experience, as well as pricing. Um, you can get started today. There's a short URL for you to remember. Uh, that's the home page for in-app payments. Um, if you already have an account, you can sign in, you, or, or you can create a new account. Um, API is available for you to play with. The documentation is available. Uh, we have a Google group that we will be actively monitoring including the engineering and the product team. So if you have questions, you have feedback, uh, please do send it to us. Once again, the hope is we can fill the gaps in anything that you think is missing, give you some lead time.
to integrate all of your apps uh, with this new payments platform. And come summer, let's delight users and make some money. Thank you. <laughs> if you have questions, please go up to the mic. Um, Mikhail, Luke, you want to come here? We can answer any questions you have. Please. Uh, hi. I have a couple of questions, actually. And uh, just looking at the, uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, if you come a little closer. That... <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. Uh, I can see in the uh, URL that it's somehow uh, uh, a brother to Google Checkout. Uh -huh. um, is that also why um, the, um, the postback for the yes or no, pretty much, you know, when, when I send a payment, is yes or no, it's still asynchronous? Why can't I just get that reply right there instead of me trying to identify the, uh, just like any kind of credit card processing, pretty much like at a gateway um, process. Is that also why that is? Okay. So first, let me summarize the questions. There's two parts to your question. Yeah, right? exactly. The first part is, is it still checkout? You see checkout in the URL somewhere. And the second was, is it asynchronous or not? Yes, because um, in that demo, um, the server gets a post which pretty much says whether or not the transaction was good or not, mm -hmm. instead of me getting it at the point sure. of purchase. So yeah. uh, there's this flow that's synchronous, and then there's the, there's the flow that's asynchronous that's happening in the background that I have to somehow pull yeah. before I give access to something. If I had that synchronously, then it's right there. It happens right there. No, that's a great question. So let me answer the first part, and I'll let Mikhail answer the second part. As far as checkout is concerned, um, so I, I showed in the diagram the whole Google Payments infrastructure. Checkout is also built on top of that. Checkout was a product that was tailored towards physical goods, shipping goods, the e-commerce wave that I talked about. And we're taking that payments kind of platform and building and innovating on top of that. So you're seeing in-app payments being the first kind of incarnation. Uh, Checkout was the older one for the physical goods. And you'll see some more offerings coming from us in the future. As far as the synchronous transactions, I'll let Mikhail answer that. Yeah, so regarding the synchronous transactions, I think we actually made it as close to synchronous as possible in JavaScript. So when you open that payment screen, you don't want that by item call you first make to be synchronous because you don't want to block the, the whole thread. And so that's why we have to make the JavaScript callbacks on the other side be callbacks instead of just the return of that call. Uh, the reason it's very close to synchronous is because that server postback is guaranteed to finish before the JavaScript callbacks are invoked. So you actually don't have to do the polling. You can just check at the time of the callback. Thanks. Yeah, please go ahead. Next question. Um, so this is cool. But um, what if, I, I mean, I like how fast it goes. But um, what if my users don't want quite that experience? You know, the problem with kids using daddy's credit card for too fast of an in-app purchase. Or the reverse of that, what if uh, there's a user timeout? If the user gets up and leaves and comes back and completes his transaction half an hour later, how do those kind of cases? It's a great question. So let me repeat that for, uh, for the recording here. Um, it sometimes goes too fast. What happens to users who are probably not trained? Um, do they make, end up making purchases when they don't even realize? I think that's, that's the question. And that's a fair point. We did think about this. And if you see there is today in the payments experience, um, an acknowledgement, a complete, you know, the user has to explicitly agree to buy an item um, before the co purchase completes. We had thought about coming up with a model that's purely single click. So you, you basically click on an item and you get it. You don't even have to acknowledge if you trust that developer. Um, so there is kind of a fine balance, and this is something I think um, will have to evolve the model. Um, as we get, get more feedback. Um, but we have kept this experience. It is kind of two-step, simply to kind of avoid that problem. And just to add a little bit to that, I think that's one of the things we're refining during this um, trial period where you guys are integrating and asking us these questions. So that was an issue that came up. We did these steps that I'm going to describe to address them, and we are thinking about doing more things. Cool. And to and add to that, I think there are, there's the expires field as well. So. Developer, developer, can they manipulate that a little bit? Control that to some extent? How long their signatures uh, are valid, for example? Yes, so you can, uh, the developers have some control over uh, how long those purchase tokens are valid. So they're not valid indefinitely. Yeah. Okay, so 
Do you have any, since you didn't talk about it, I can assume that there's no support for a subscription model then? So the question is, is there support for subscription model? Yeah. We don't have in, in the product we're launching today. Uh, that's something that we, we are going to build uh, in the coming months. Okay, and do you also have um, APIs and such so that since you're handling the trans the payment and such, do you have APIs available so that you know, that we could query what is the um, transaction history of a given user so that we don't have to keep any logging on our end as far as what happened and who paid what and all that? Yeah. Do you have uh, not at this time. Hello, I have a question about the relation with uh, Android purchase, and what if we have uh, the same code base for uh, Chrome app and uh, in JavaScript and uh, Android app in a package like PhoneGap or something. It, can we use that, or are we supposed to use uh, two different uh, payment systems? Yeah. So the question is, how does this relate to Android app, uh, if I were to paraphrase that? Actually, I see some of the folks leaving, so I'm going to interrupt the answer one minute. And um, we do have some special session T-shirts that you should collect on your way out um, if you're le leaving. Um, but coming back to the question, Android app versus the mobile app. So there's, there's a couple of kind of clarifications I'll make, which is we are using the same underlying payments infrastructure. And when I talked about that account, the user base that has transacted on any of these properties, that kind of comes with along. So if the user, it's an Android app, they've created an account there that's applicable here, um, you know, they have single sign-in. So as far as the payments underlying infrastructure, that is shared. Now mobile and a pure web, they are inherently different models. Uh, you see that difference between Chrome Web Store and, you know, mobile specific marketplaces. And so the pricing structure will be uh, what applies to either cases. Yes, please. So, so this is a question to add on to the first person. So if the callback to the server is synchronous, right? So what happened if the server and we cannot handle it? For example, like our game server may be overloaded. So you send this to us, like uh, we cannot deliver the good because like that there's some issue with the system. Is the transaction considered completed or is the transaction or do we have to do something else to tell you? It's like we're having some issues. Could you repeat uh, uh, the question? The question was, what happens if you couldn't acknowledge the postback or if you return an error instead of a success on that postback acknowledgement? And or a timeout. Or a timeout. Yeah. And the answer is that uh, at that point, the buyer is still looking at the payment screen, and we show them that we could not deliver the item and that their order will be canceled. Can I do something like uh, I return to you saying the transaction is completed on my end, but it's going to be later to deliver to the user? Uh, no, we want the user experience to be uh, either successful or a failure. So that if they want to get the purchase later, they just have to go again and try it again. Okay. So what would you suggest in the case of like a massive sales? Like let's say the game is really popular. They're doing a flash sales for like five minutes or an hour. Uh, you should host your app on App Engine. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, so in order, if, if the users can't get the thing they're buying, um, then that's uh, part of the same problem. If, if your app is overloaded, they might not even be able to get to the purchase screen. So if, so if that part of your app works, then the postback handling should also work. And the truth is, this is an in-app experience. This is a user who was in your app. In, let's, let's, let, let's use a game as an example. So they're in the game. And they just, they're getting frustrated and angry birds, and they, can't, they want that eagle, and they want to do it, and they click buy, and then you want to tell them, no, you can't have it for like a day or two. So in this case, because we're in-app, it's not like something you're buying that might ship tomorrow from Amazon. But it's something they want right now. They want immediate gratification. So we're thinking of it from the user's perspective. They either want it, or they don't want to be charged for it. And we, this is something we learned at Jamboard, at Social Gold was. But I'm not talking about a day. I'm talking about like a, let's say a five minute or something shorter. It's just not like 30 seconds. Hmm. Yeah, we should probably talk about that. that should okay. Be, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I don't want to talk. Yeah. Gentlemen at the back. Um, so uh, what about support? Like uh, if there's a user has a, 
any dispute or anything that the uh, support goes direct goes to uh, Google first or go to like the app the, uh, seller? So yes. the question is the Google group who's supporting that? Uh, no, like the users, user support. Oh, support the user for support. The user, yeah. I see. So as far as the payments disputes, uh, mm. you know, what happened to my credit card, it didn't go through, that is all using the existing support mechanisms that we have mm -hmm. with Google Payments, that is also with yeah. checkout. So mm -hmm. we, we have the same support team, same support mm -hmm. forums um, that you'll get for the end users. So you'll get that. But we're okay. growing it. Yeah, okay. and yeah, we're staffing it as we get more developers. So does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, a second question is uh, how to uh, handle the refund. How do you handle refunds? Yeah. Um, so we are actually working through the, the whole mm -hmm. refund chargeback policy. Okay. Um, if you subscribe to the groups, we'll, we'll do an update very shortly. <coughs> okay, and uh, one more question is that, uh, uh, so you said that the Flash API is not yet available, but I think Plants, Plants versus Lumbi is a Flash game, and how do they yeah. integrate? So, so the question is, Flash API is not available, Plants versus Zombie is a Flash game. So Jake, I, I can answer on his behalf. I think they're using, mm -hmm. PopCap has moved to using uh, an HTML-based uh, payments flow. So they're using the HTML version, JavaScript version of the API. And, and I can add to that a little bit yeah. too. Okay. Uh, many Flash games use uh, a window mode setting when they embed their Swift that draws directly to the screen. Uh, and, and some Flash games don't, some Flash games too do. Uh, depending on how that setting is done, you, you may or may not be able to overlay an iframe above a Flash, you know, a running Flash application. And so our Flash API is specifically and especially for those games or applications that cannot overlay an iframe uh, and want to have the application, all the application handling done directly in ActionScript 3. But you can, if you're, in, if you're in the case where you can overlay, you can pretty easily use external interface or some other means to talk to JavaScript on the page and lo load the iframe above your app and, and let it close and get the callbacks that way. It should be on now. Try. Try now. Hello. Yeah. So basically, they are using an external interface code to. Uh, invoke the JavaScript API, is that how they? I believe so, is that, uh, I assume that's true. Yeah, I'm getting nods over here. I, yeah, okay. that sounds right. For this cool. demo, yeah. And, and Thank you. Oh. And the, the okay. Bobcap uh, folks mm -hmm. from Bobcap are also here, so you mm -hmm. can, you know, if you have more okay. follow-up questions, feel free to ask yeah. them. All right, thank you. Thank you. you can take a question in the back. How do I get it? <laughs> how do I get what? How do I sign up to uh, be a? Uh, uh, so, there's a URL here to sign up, and probably this is the one on the top that you're going to remember. Ah. So go to Google 5% fees, it'll take, it'll take you to the sign up page. Cool. And is there a minimum browser level for this? I mean, does this support like iOS 3 or Android yeah. 2.0 or IE 7 or that kind of stuff? So the question is, is there a minimum browser? So we, we are supporting all standard browsers. It's in our documentation. Uh, I believe it's IE 7 and above, uh, Firefox 3, um, Android browser. Safari, so we'll support all standard browsers. Nice. Yeah. I think we're tailoring the experience right now for the desktop to clarify that. Yeah. So, so uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up question about the, the Android thing. So I understood Android Store has a different cut, and there are whole s lots of reasons for that. But if I do an Android app and I use your API to do an in-app in purchase, are you going to disable that? Are you going to take a different cut because it's an Android app? How's that going to work? So the question is, there are different models on Android on the web. Uh, what happens if you build an Android app and use our API? Um, you cannot use this API for native Android apps. Mm -hmm. Anything that's a web app, and if you're on a phone and you're using the web, and you're getting to your app through the web, it's not a native app, then you can use this API. So there's a distinction between native and web apps. This platform is for wherever web goes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, next question. When will you make this available for uh, international developers? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, when will you make it available for international developers? Um, I mentioned we're going to go live in summer. Uh, at that point, we'll support um, all our uh, international developers. So whatever Google Payments supports, I think I believe it's 21 countries. Um, seller countries, so you can have um, 21 different uh, locations where developers can sign up and have local currencies and stuff like that. So the summer launch will have the international component. Yes, please go. Uh, yeah, obviously kind of excited about this. Um, uh, 
you said that this was based on the payments platform. So can we leverage our existing checkout, the notifications, the signing and all that, or is this totally different? Uh, so question is, can you leverage the notifications? I, uh, because you said that this was um, somehow on top of that whole uh, payments infrastructure, which is where checkout is also based out of. Mm -hmm. um, can we leverage existing um, knowledge already about the API for checkout, for example, like the notification? Okay. There's some similarity in there and then the signing and all that. So just wondering. So it, it will be similar, but it's not the same. So you will have to go do uh, this in-app integration. Yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the focus has been that you don't have to worry about a lot of concepts when you integrate. So in the checkout classical physical goods model, you have carts, you have shipping, taxes. You have to worry about a lot of things. And the API actually hides all of that complexity. It's you basically price, currency, and description. And that's all you need to worry about. So our hope is you don't have to use uh, some of the different models. That's good. Uh, gentlemen at the back, and then I'll take your question. Uh, which group of international uh, developers are going to get access to this? Is it going to be the ones for, uh, that can sell on Android or the ones that can sell in Google Checkout? Because countries like Canada can't do Google Checkout yet. Um, so the question is regarding Canada. Um, I don't have an accurate answer for you right now, but we will follow up in our group's postings, so please do subscribe, and we'll, we'll actually publish a detailed uh, international rollout plan. Yes, um, I have a vertical portal, okay, website. Um, so um, would it be possible to implement the Google Payments in, in that website? And in that case, will it compete with Google, PayPal, and all of the other um, uh, types of checkout that are in the market? So I'll repeat your question. You have a vertical website where you want to integrate payments, and will this platform work? Absolutely. As I said, this is not only for Chrome Web Store, for any web app on the web. So you can integrate it no matter where, where your application resides. Um, I'm not sure about the second part of your question. Could yeah, you the second part is when, when you have the checkout, and if you can integrate this, uh, the Google app, and then you also have, for example, the PayPal type of payment, then the user will have to choose one of them to check out. Yeah. Uh, so basically, they are competing, and, yeah. and is the, the one who will decide will be the user either to take to take the Google one or, or the PayPal one. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the question is if you have competing payment options. Yeah. And I think that's fair. There's nothing that precludes you from doing that. You can have PayPal, Amazon, Google. You know, uh, That's kind of a practice. A lot of websites accept payments from different things. And it's up to your users uh, what they want to choose. So you can absolutely do that. There, there is one more thing to clarify. This is, and I, I don't think it was made clear, this is for uh, virtual and digital goods. So if you have a website that sells you know, physical products to people that you mail to them, this is not an appropriate API for you. So we certainly could be next to a PayPal button for virtual digital goods uh, in an environment like that. Will it develop into that uh, in the future? We'll see how the platform evolves. OK. Thank you. Sorry, questions here. The first one is, um, what kind of user data we have? Like, can we get even like username or you know, address or anything? And the second one is like, what kind of user analytics you provide if we use this API? Thanks. So I'll repeat the question. What kind of user data we have? So could you? If user purchase any virtual good, right? I assume my system knows like what's the first name and the last name and address and everything, right? So what kind of user data we as like a vendor or a developer get? Yeah. So the question is, what kind of user data that Google is collecting will, will be shared yes, with developers. Exactly. Um, so this, is, this data, because it's very sensitive, it's okay. considered PII, it's, it's credentials, payments credentials, address, name. We do not share this data okay. with any uh, developer. OK, so then what kind of like, uh, user analytics do we have? Like, do you know, like, I don't know, maybe the age between like 25 to 35, you know, purchase list item you know, within the first month or I see. something like that. So you're analytics. looking for a analytics with the demographic exactly. data. Exactly. We, we don't have that okay. today. Um, uh, you know, our analytics is basically across the user base. It's anonymized. Okay. So we basically tell cool. you how they're converting. Thanks.
And again, we have our forums are open, so we're hoping that questions like that, like you guys can help guide the product as we, as we work this summer over it. Great. Thank you for your time and patience. Uh, I'm being asked to leave and vacate the stage. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys.